Hi, I'm JP Hong from Seoul, Korea. It is good to see you here at the meeting of lymphedema in Santiago, Chile, hosted by my past fellow and my good friend, Dr. Nicolas Pereira. I'm sorry that I cannot be there in person, but nevertheless, I hope the meeting would be very fruitful, which I know it would be. And I hope this would be giving you an opportunity to learn more about lymphedema as well as to get started in lymphedema. Today, my talk will be based on the latest innovations and the evidence that's gathered around the latest innovations and give you a glimpse of what is ahead in the future. For those who are starting lymphedema, this may not be something that you might want to do immediately, but nevertheless, as you go and as you evolve through the practice of lymphedema, uh, this would be somewhere that you want to able to reach ultimately. So nevertheless, thank you again for the invitation and my apologies for not being there. And I know this will be a great meeting and I hope to see you all in person soon enough. After all, Chile is my hometown. So when we're talking about lymphedema, um, I guess you have to understand the whole aspect of the uh, lymphedema uh, surgery itself. And the most important thing that you have to begin with is understanding the anatomy. And basically, ultimately, the lymphatic drainage uh, all over our system ultimately drains into the subclavian vein of both left and right. And 20% of the fluid that is uh, the lymphatic fluid that is responsible for 20% of our body fluid ultimately drains the vein. It is that fact that we're trying to use uh, to ultimately reconstitute the physiologic flow. And the first question you have to really ask is, where is the obstruction? So let's take a look at this kid here. And you can see that there's a chylothorax, there's lymphatics draining into the pleural space. And this patient had a congenital agenesis of the kidney. And because there was a block, and because uh, the patient was getting catheter for the um, hemodialysis, they eventually uh, ruptured and damaged the subclavian vein. We tried to go directly, but there was too much scarring to fix the problem. So here, because of the obstruction, there is overloading distal to the obstruction on the uh, lymphatic system. So what we did was we did distal um, for LVAs in the lower extremity, and you could see that the amount of the drainage from the chylothorax or the pleural space was almost gone in one month and we were able to remove the pigtail. So it's very understand, it's very important to understand where the obstruction is and going distal to the obstruction to actually um, relieve uh, the high pressure of the lymphatic system. So ultimately uh, in the past, we were solving the problem by debulking. But this one, not, that's a, it's not a permanent solution, it's a, a temporary solution, and it does not really address or recover the main um, physiology of the system. And of course, it does not improve the quality of life. So it has been the quest of all reconstructive surgery to actually reach those goals. And there are three main components uh, when you talk about reconstructive surgery. In our hands, it's the uh, aspect of using supermicrosurgery, lymph node to vein anastomosis, a lymphatical vein anastomosis, and of course, replacing what is missing, uh, which is also microsurgery using free flaps with uh, lymph nodes. And this idea of doing lymphatic to venous anastomosis or bypass is not really something new. This idea has been researched since the 60s in animal models, and ultimately O'Brien and his team in Aust Australia has tried it. But the result was, was somewhat... Uh, variable. It was not always constantly good. And the main reason, although this has been around for a long time, was they were not able to really evaluate which lymphatic system is still functioning. And they would anastomose to a already sclerotic or degenerated lymphatics, and they would not have a good result. You also have to remember that the degeneration occurs from proximal to distal. So in the past, when they were able to only do large vessels, like the, in the groin region, connect the lymphatics to the vein, if it was not degenerated, they would have good results. But the reality is, as the disease of lymphedema progresses, then the degeneration occurs proximal to distal. And this is why a lot of the times they are faced with degenerated lymphatic vessels. So the key idea here is because they were not able to find functional lymphatics. If we're able to find functional lymphatics, 
this could dominate and really change the paradigm of surgery into more successful results. And there are many uh, preoperative studies, and I think this is the first innovation that really changed the practice in having a better outcome for LDAs, especially. Uh, the studies are limb scintography, MR lymphangiogram, and I think uh, Nicholas has really done great work in using the MR lymphangiogram and overcoming the limits and tracing using augmented reality. And of course, there's the ultrasound, there's the ICG imaging, and of course, there's the gamma probing. And we've actually looked into various uh, modalities to actually get information about lymphedema. And it all has its ups and downs. But the reality is the more information you have, the better planning you're able to do and ultimately have a better understanding and have a better result. But in our hands, I think what the two most essential uh, modalities of imaging is the ICG and the ultrasound. And we'll go a little bit more deeper uh, into why these two are the most important uh, imaging. And you can see here that uh, the simple detection rate is very high in MR and Vanjo, ICG, and as well as the ultrasound. But what's really um, interesting is that the conversion rate into success in the early process of the disease of the lymphedema, they're all relatively high. But as the disease progresses more, using the ICG or using the MRI becomes more difficult in translating into a more successful outcome, whereas the ultrasound constantly gives you a good outcome. And why is that? Because there are several factors. And here is a typical example of the of how we use the uh, ICG and the ultrasound. And here you can see that, uh, especially in advanced stages, um, when you do the IC and this is actually in stage two, and actually stage one and stage two, ICG really gives you great imaging. The reason why is that the ICG only penetrates around 15 to maximum 20 uh, millimeters. And a lot of the advanced cases where they have thick subcutaneous uh, it does not give you the information what's going on underneath the 20 millimeter. And here in, in the relatively early stages, you could still get good information with ICG and addition to the ultrasound. And here in this patient is a stage three, and you can see that there's nothing, a stardust pattern. And we bring in the ultrasound to actually see if there's no functioning uh, lymphatics. And in this case, uh, this patient actually has zero functional lymphatics. And the good news is that only 8% of stage three lymphedema actually has almost complete degeneration. So 94% of the time with the right imaging tool, you're able to find the lymphatic vessel. So here in this case, we only saw the vein. Now let's take a look at another stage three lymphedema patient, again with the ICG, the same starless pattern, uh, but nevertheless, now we bring in the ultrasound. And in this case, you could see that blue arrow actually shows a function in lymphatics. And what's really great about the ultrasound is that it also can map out a nearby vein. And that really helps you to have a minimal uh, invasive and just have the right incision go in, right in, and do the anastomosis. So 94% of the time, even though the ICG is not able to show, especially in stage three, using the ultrasound gives you the right image. So that's the good news. So again, with the ICG in more advanced stages, you have limitation of penetration. So you really don't know what's going on, but nevertheless, using the ultrasound, it gives you more information, especially in depth. So the question is, what kind of ultrasound do we actually use? So when we say ultrasound, the normal frequency is less than 10 megahertz, usually used in cardiology or looking at tissues. A Little bit higher is called the high frequency ultrasound, which is 10 to 20 megahertz. And the ultra high frequency is 20 to 70 megahertz. Now higher the, the frequency, the better the resolution. So higher the frequency, you're able to see smaller structures more clearly. But the trade-off is that higher the frequency, the penetration rate becomes less. So in our practice, we, we try using the high frequency ultrasound around 18 megahertz. And this is using any ultrasound uh, that your anesthesiology has. You could use a hockey stick probe. It usually has an 18 megahertz frequency. And sometimes that would be enough to actually trace the functional lymphatics as well as the nearby vein. If that's not enough, 40 megahertz really does most of the job. However, if you do have the luxury to use this ultra high frequency ultrasound, in this case, MDB Bofujifilm, it has a 40 megahertz probe and it also has 
a 70 plus megahertz probe and you could clearly see uh, the lymphatics and even sometimes be able to see the lymphatic vein. So with this high frequency and ultra high frequency ultrasound, you can clearly identify the functional lymphatics, really making it easier to do the LVA. So the first innovation, the clearly the most important innovation is identifying functional lymphatic vessels and the nearby vein using the ultrasound. And again, if you have the luxury to have all these modalities, it gives you better information, but if not, uh, ultrasound, I would say, with along with the ICG is the best two modalities to really find the functional lymphatic vessels. Uh, now, there are continuous um, innovations that are going on in the field of imaging, and this is a laser uh, tomography, and you can see that it also gives you a clear image of the lymphatics, but right now, this is on a trial phase, and hopefully we'll be able to see more better imaging um, as the day passes. I think the second innovation really allowed a successful lymphedema surgery is the ability to actually do lymphatical venous anastomosis. This is clearly the key, and this is using the concept of supermicrosurgery. As Dr. Kushima says, supermicrosurgery is a concept using vessels less than 0.8 millimeters. So why 0.8? Because when I was in training, it was statistically significant. Any vessels under one millimeter had a higher chance of failure. And it was actually almost a, uh, a contraindication to do these small vessels. But back then we had really bad um, magnification microscopes, only had 10 or nine, nine nylons. But now with new imaging, new magnification, higher magnification, and sutures even 11, 12, and 13 0 were able to redefine and actually allow high success rate, even though vessels are under one millimeter. So hence the idea of doing 0 0.8 uh, millimeters defines the idea of supermicrosurgery as Dr. Koshima. And now we have many tools that allows us to do and have successful result as doing any microsurgery. And also going into the field of supermicrosurgery, this has led to further innovation. Now we have robots uh, that actually able to do ultra fine anastomosis without any tremor. So any beginner is actually able to do it. And this is a typical example of a Simani robot. You can see that it has a master and a slave relationship with the robot. And this is a 0 0.7 vessel. And you're able to have clear vision without any shaking. And this is another innovation that's extended from the idea of supermicrosurgery. So again, why is this important? And if you think about it, again, in the beginning, when they started to do LVA, they only could do it in the proximal large lymph lymphatics and large veins. But however, this is where the degeneration occurs first. So going distal and where the degenerations are less and there is more chance of finding functional lymphatics, this allowed the chance to have a successful lymphovenous bypass. And that is the significance of this using the supermicrosurgery. So again, the microsurgical concept, which is the second biggest innovation, is doing LVA, lymph node to vein, which we'll be talking about in a minute, and of course, doing lymph node flaps uh, to, um, to, to allow regeneration of the lymphatic system. So first, lymphovenous anastomosis. And the key here is selecting a functioning lymphatics and selecting an ideal vein. So that's the two most important components and understanding the physiology, understanding that there's a high pressure lymphatics, allowing the drainage into the low pressure vein and understanding the physiology. So how do we select an ideal lymphatic vessels? And as this is one of the work by Japan's Mihara group. And you can see as the disease progresses, the amount of degeneration increases. But the good news is that not all lymphatic vessels are completely degenerated as Dr. Mihara shows. Some of them are still functioning. And the trick here is to find larger lymphatics, functioning lymphatics. The larger lymphatics are usually located deeper in the subcutaneous fat, in the deeper subcutaneous fat below the superficial fascia. That is where anatomically larger lymphatics are at. And of course, you want to find the functioning one. So you can see this um, figure here, comparing the more superficial one to the more deeper ones, and you can actually see the diameter becomes large. So finding large 
anatomically located lymphatics, as well as functional lymphatics, is the key to finding ideal lymphatic structure. But what about the ideal vein? Not many people talk about the ideal vein. First of all, it has to be available. Sometimes you do find a good lymphatics in the beginning, but we don't find the vein. And we have to abandon uh, the, the, the lymphatic uh, vessel. But now using the ultrasound, we're able to identify a nearby vein and, and, it, and incise correctly where we previously identified a functioning vein, a functional lymphatics as the vein. Also, the venous pressure has to be low. Remember, LVA is using pressure gradient. So if the venous pressure is high, the amount of drainage becomes less. So you want a vein with low pressure, and that means low backflow. And you're able to identify this again using the ultrasound. And now knowing that, we've actually come up with the concept using uh, the venturi effect. Now there's many ways to do the anastomosis. There's end of the lymphatics to the end of the vein, end of the lymphatics to the side of the vein, side of the lymphatics to the end of the vein, and side to side. But we did a lot of research to actually see what is the ideal way. And what we found out was that if you use a branch from the main vein and hooking it up to the side of the lymphatics, this actually gives the best result. And this was recently published uh, in PRS. And you could see why in early, a relatively early disease lymphat lymphedema, such as stage one or stage two early, you could see that there is no difference. However, when you do more advanced disease like stage two late and stage three, there is a significantly better reduction. And why is this? Because if you think about it, the more advanced the, the disease state they are, the more dilated the lymphatics. And once the lymphatic dilates, the valve function doesn't work anymore. So you actually have anterograde and retrograde flow. So you have actually backflow of the lymphatics. So if you hook it to the side, you're actually collecting uh, both of the lymphatic flow from distal as well as proximal. But more in the early disease state, as you can see here in figure A, the lymphatics are not dilated and the valves are still functioning. So if you even do side to end, it's still doing end to end because the, the valves are still functioning. And this is why in more advanced cases, side to end actually works better. And this is the diagram. But what we've also actually found out was that if you look carefully, when the small vein comes out from the major vein, there are actually many valves. Uh, just at the border of where the small vein comes, you could actually see valves. And when you cut the, uh, the branch coming out from the main vein, there's rarely a backflow. And using the valvular structure, also allows better flow. And when the small vessel drains to a larger vein, because of the ven Venerli law, the velocity increases and the velocity from the small vein to the large vein increases, thus sucking up the fluid, which is called the venturi effect. And this is how we anastomose the, the vessels today. So here you can see that uh, when we take a branch, of the vein, and when you cut it, there's minimal backflow. And when you anastomose it to the side of the lymphatics, you could actually see the lymphatics being sucked in to the vein. And this is how the ventry uh, effect works. And what we found out through this ventry, ventry effect is that it actually helps to decrease the volume of the limb much more faster than the non ventry. So Obviously, this is sucking out the fluid more rapidly and allowing faster reduction. However, after one year, the ultimate uh, change in the volume is similar between the non-ventry and the ventry because after all, after, you, after the draining gets better, the pressure gradient between the lymphatics and the vein becomes similar and they arrive at a homeostasis and thus um, ends in, in a very uh, reduced state. So if you wait long enough, the non-ventry comes ultimately to the ventry level. However, if you think about the patient, they want faster results, then ventry is the way to go and move forward. So we talked about how the supermicrosurgery works, selecting the ideal vein, selecting the ideal lymphatics, and how this has really helped, including the imaging, uh, to improve uh, the approach to physiologic um, uh, lymphedema surgery. So we're doing this now for uh, advanced stages as well. And we published this work. And you can see that for advanced stages, even in stage three, 
the concept of LVA actually still works. Again, this is using the pressure gradient concept and you can see here in this patient here, stage three lymphedema after hooking it up to the side of the lymphatics to the end of the vein, you're able to see rapid decompression of the patient here and the patient's able to have a good result. And this is a patient with long-term result as well. And we're able to have decrease in the, in the, in the volume uh, of the fluid component and ultimately adding secondary liposuction and removing the fibrosis, we're able to improve the overall uh, status of the limb and provide a long lasting uh, result. Another uh, component of the physiologic surgery is doing lymph node to vein anastomosis. Now this concept is not new again. If you think about it, uh, especially in the lower extremity, where is the point of obstruction? And most of the lower extremity lymphedema comes from gynecological cancer, uterus or ovarian, and in males, uh, prostate cancer. And a lot of these uh, cancer patients are removing the lymph nodes from their iliac uh, vessels or in the intrapelvic cavity, not in the groin. So theoretically, the flow all the way up to the groin lymph node should be intact uh, when you see this patient in their early state. Now, if you look at the limb scintography, you could actually see that there's no flood flow going into the groin. But what does this mean? Does this mean that uh, there is no functional lymph node? No, this actually means uh, in the limb scintography, it's usually one hour, two hour, or four hour scans in our hospitals, two hour scans. It means that the flow is so slow that there is no uptake in two hours. But if you look at the MRI, you could actually see a sizable lymph nodes. So we start to think, ah, maybe the flow is slow, but the function is still there. And we start to identify relatively large uh, lymph nodes which are functioning uh, we, around one centimeter. And we start to hook these lymph nodes up to the superficial vein. And, and again, this idea is not new. Um, this was first done in a dog model by Dr. Kalnan et al. in 1968. And from the Polish group, Dr. Oz, uh, Ozewski, uh, reported in 1988. But however, again, uh, the results were not always good. And the reason why is because the degeneration occurs from the proximal. So that there's a lot of lymph nodes under degeneration, especially in advanced stages. So the idea here is the same, finding functional lymph nodes. Again, um, uh, Dr. Takumi also tried to do it in the efferent vessel, but this is super microsurgery. Uh, but we try to collect from efferent and afferent, drilling into the medulla and hooking up the large superficial vein. And really, this is not super micro, it's macro surgery. And basically, anybody is able to do it. And this is how basically it works. Uh, again, we use the ICG imaging the night before. Um, and again, when we open, uh, we find the superficial vein, we cut it, we make sure we understand the direction of the flow. And under the ICG, when we light up the ICG, you could actually see functioning um, lymph nodes. And if you see this uptake, it means there is a lymphatic flow going up all the way to the groin. And once we see this, we penetrate the capsule and we penetrate into the medullary space and make sure that there is lymphatic fluid coming out. So here we're using a needle and then we're puncturing. And you have to always identify this in the ICG mode. And you could actually see the fluorescent increasing. So definitely there is a lymphatic fluid uh, that is coming out, confirmed by the ICG. Uh, sometimes very difficult with the naked eye. But when you see this, you go ahead and you do the lymph node to vein anastomosis. Now, sometimes even if we uh, find it with the MRI, it doesn't, it still undergoes degeneration or the medullary space is very small to identify. So here in this, uh, we've actually um, identified the ultrasound parameters that shows us clearly which is a functioning lymph node and which has the maximum medullary space. And we're able to identify that and use this to do lymph node to vein and which we reported a satisfactory outcome in relatively early state of lymphedema. Again, post-operative care, uh, very important all in these physiologic surgeries to do compression, which maximizes the pressure gradient between the lymphatics and the vein. 
And we're not going to go into detail about the next physiologic surgery, which is replacing what is missing, uh, lymph node flap. I'm very sure the other um, uh, the other presenters will be able to touch upon. But nevertheless, the second biggest uh, innovation with evidence is understanding the physiologic surgery, especially LVA and lymph node to vein anastomosis. Now, there is some modification of uh, the lymphatic uh, node transfer. Uh, some even just say lymphatic tissue transfer. So this is just um, uh, flapping uh, tissues uh, with lymphatic vessels. And sometimes uh, people take the lymph node with the lymphatic duct and do duct to duct uh, anastomosis as well. Here's an example of a post-traumatic um, thigh completely. There's no fat in the upper medial thigh where usually the lymphatic flow is there. Uh, the lymphatic vessel is anatomically present. Uh, in this case, we take a DIEP, reconstitute the pathway of the lymphatics. And as you can see, reconstitute the pathway. And here uh, we are constituting the continuity of the fat and making aligned into the correct pathway, allowing to have the best chance for regeneration of the lymphatic vessel. And this is the result. And you can see that there is a reduction of the lymphedema. So using these kind of lymphatic tissue, understanding alignment of the lymphatic vessel, I think allows us to reconstruct and have a reasonable result in post-traumatic lymphedema as well. Now there is concept of now going into preventive LVA, lympha, but I think this is, uh, we still do not have enough information yet, but nevertheless, we have to understand uh, we cannot do all um, preventive lymphedema surgery for all the patients that undergo breast cancer is way too much. So I think identifying the right indication, uh, which are high risk in this case, could be the critical component of doing future preventive lymphedema surgery. Um, we've done some cases, report cases on sarcoma, where we removed the sarcoma and did distal LV as well in the extremity. Uh, that also is able to prevent. However, if you go proximal and do the LVA, this will allow the cancer to spread. And this was the finding from our past fellow, Dr. Nun from Thailand, and actually showed that the survival rate becomes worse when you go proximal uh, to the cancer and actually do the LVA. So you have to understand uh, all these physiologic um, factors in doing uh, preventive LVA. I think the third uh, greatest innovation for us was actually measuring a post-operative outcome. Now, the, the most common way to measure post-operative outcome now is uh, measuring the circumference or measuring the volume of the limb. But the physiologic surgery addresses the fluid component, the lymphatic fluid component. By doing LVA, it reduces the fluid or the accumulation of fluid and improves the accumulation, ultimately reducing the volume. But in advanced lymphedema patients, uh, there's not only accumulation of fluid, but because of the chronicity and the progression, these fat becomes fibrosed. And there is a fibrosis component of the lymphedema as well. So if you're able to measure the fluid component only, which we're able to do by using bioimpedance analysis, segmental bioimpedance analysis, this tells you exactly how much fluid was improved and thus tells you whether or not the functioning, functional surgery or the physiologic surgery actually worked. So even though um, if you operate on a, a patient, physiologic surgery on a patient, it's stage three. And if you see minimal volume reduction, it doesn't mean that the su surgery was not success. It, you have to look at what happened to the fluid component. And this is how it does. And now we're able to exactly see whether or not these physiologic surgeries worked. So having these post-operative uh, measurements, knowing and focusing on the physiology surgery, which is the fluid and measuring the fluid component is critical. I think the next innovation is <clears throat> understanding the multidisciplinary approach and understanding that there is a team to work with. And another, in addition to the multidisciplinary approach, now we're able to customize the approach. If it's fibrosis, do debulking, such as liposuction, um, physiologic surgery, if there's a fluid component and you ultimately mix it, you could stage it, you could do it single stage, or you could do it in multiple stage. You could do the non-physiologic first, the physiologic second, or you could do it by, vice versa. Everything has to be based on the multidisciplinary approach and 
understanding and customizing uh, the approach to each patient's indication, not only for the upper, but the lower extremity as well. So the individualized combined approach, I think is the way to go and has shown great outcome as shown here in the PROM that which we measured doing this kind of approach had a very good uh, patient uh, response outcome measure. Uh, and we know that the patient is satisfied uh, when they see positive results. Now there are multiple other approaches. Uh, for example, you could do a malignant melanoma and we sometimes do it in conjunction with the lymph node on the skip. Breast cancer, you could actually do it, lymph node on the DIEP and some sarcoma cases that underwent radiology. You could actually do a similar thing uh, after debridement completely, do a skip flap with a lymph node and ultimately help the patient to improve their symptoms. So we talked about the four major innovations that has occurred in our practice. Again, first of all is the capability of allowing us to measure functioning lymphatics. Uh, second is understanding these imaging tools and what you can do with to clearly find these functioning lymphatic vessels or along with an ideal vein. Uh, now we understand what treatment options are there, the physiologic surgery, the non-physiologic surgery, understanding the measurement of the fluid component and combining all these approach and individualizing with a multidisciplinary approach. So these has been the four major innovations that we see clear evidence that is helping. I think for those who are going into the lymphedema service, you know, this is, this is a surgery that takes a lot of patients. Um, when I began um, the LVA um, back in 2005, it was very difficult with poor microscopes and with only 10 sutures. But if you continue to work with it, and as Dr. Koshima says, believe it works. And then you ultimately get better. Your skills evolve and you get better instruments. And a lot of these patients actually have very slow results. So be patient. Believe it works. And, and please don't give up. And as Dr. Koshima says, this is a very difficult field, but you must continue to believe and you must continue to push yourself. If you do it, and if you do a couple of surgeries, say, oh, it doesn't work. And if you quit, you're not going to be, help, be able to help these patients. And you have to understand that our profession is, especially in reconstructive surgery, is we always see failures. I still see failures. Every great surgeon still, see, still sees failures. And through failures, we get better. We understand what we did wrong and we evolve. We find more evidence. So keep on pushing yourself because if you don't do, if you never do, there is never innovation. And what's really exciting about lymphedema is that this is an ongoing science. And a lot of these factors are still very early stage findings. And these are preliminary. And of course, the skills and the technique and the technology is evolving. So this is a very exciting field uh, that we are in. But most of all, the lymphedema surgery really allows us as surgeons to give hope for the one out of 100,000 primary lymphedema cases, for the 20% of the patients that occur lymphedema after cancer lymph node resection, which is almost more than 300 million patients around the world. How many surgery as plastic surgeons are we able to give such great hope? And this is why lymphedema surgery is so exciting. With that, I want to invite you for those who ever wants to come to Seoul or drop by Seoul to our hospital in Seoul, Assam Medical Center. So thank you again, Dr. Nicholas Pereira, my good friend, my past fellow, and one of the leading innovators in lymphedema in South America for this wonderful visit. Uh, Chile, Santiago is my hometown. I'm Chilean, and I'm really sorry that I cannot be there in person, but hopefully I, I will be able to see you in the upcoming WSRM in Singapore this August, or if not, hopefully someday in Chile. So with that, thank you very much, and I hope to answer any questions if there is any. Bye-bye.